House of the Dragon Season 1 has come and gone, but this is the time that I enjoy because I get to look at the entire season as a whole and come up with an analysis based on the total package rather than by episode breakdowns. Costume designer Jenny Tamim said that for Season 1, she created 2,000 costumes for the background players and 300 or more for the principal characters. With that amount of costumes, there are certainly going to be some hits and misses, so I thought that I would break it down into two videos, starting with the hits. If you enjoy the costumes, then this is the video for you. But before I proceed, there will be spoilers for all eight episodes of House of the Dragon. Also, I might touch on the books occasionally, but if you are a show-only watcher, I won't take it beyond where we leave the show off at the end of the season. Now let's get to it. Color. I thought that this is a great place to start because the show is sort of like a canvas ready to be painted with a palette of colors. In a way, it's a very easy place for the showrunners and the design team to start because not only are the sigil colors in the source material, but they are also featured prominently in HBO's Game of Thrones. What is a bit different here, however, is that the colors at times are much more intense in House of the Dragon. They do wax and wane a bit, and they are not always so on the nose, and I appreciated it. So from a storytelling perspective, the palette will reflect a situation or even show the allegiances or betrayals of a character. Each of the houses are represented in their full sigil colors, black and red for the Targaryens, smoky gray for House High Tower, red and gold for the Lannisters, and silver and seafoam green for House Valerion. Throughout the season, you see some characters move in and out of house colors. Alicent is likely the most prominent character whose story arc is closely aligned with her color palette. She starts off in an innocent, muted blue-gray and smoky gray, while her friendship with Rhaenyra is solid, into the teal blue and the green-black gown that belonged to her mother when, without the knowledge of Rhaenyra, she is spending time with Viserys. After she marries Viserys, she moves in the direction of Viserys' late wife, Emma, who dressed in a pinky rose color. The color begins to become more saturated as she begins to feel more isolated and suspicious of Rhaenyra. But then in episode 5, bang, right into the emerald green. From there on, she is largely in this color. We also see the green council, most notably Otto Hightower, with the green creeping into his wardrobe. As a young woman, Rhaenyra is in golds and soft pink like her mother, but as she matures, her wardrobe is largely dominated by reds, black, and gold. By the end of season one, she embraces her full targ colors. Viserys is the most steadfast dressed throughout the season consistently in black, red, and gold. As babies, Allison's children are dressed in targ colors, but as a mother, who likely selects the clothing of her children, the boys, and at times Helena, are dressed in green. One thing I noticed is that as a young girl of about the same age as Rhaenyra, that Helena also wears pink, but then into gold as a married woman with children of her own. While Princess Rhaenys and Corlys dressed in Valerian colors, she begins to move back into her targ colors, especially with her armor, which also matches the color of her dragon Maelys, called the Red Queen. There's one really clever use of color, with Laner and Joffrey at the pre-wedding banquet in the episode We Like the Way. Dressed in similar style tunics, Laner's hair is silver white, while Joffrey wears a silvery brocade, with Laner wearing gold and brown brocade, to tie into Joffrey's golden brown hair. One outlier here, and I have mentioned it in another video, is Lara Strong, who is dressed in Tyrion purple, when the colors of House Strong are green, red, and blue. Now that the design team have put all of their cards on the table, it will be interesting to see what they do with the colors come future seasons. Fabrics One of my favorite aspects of costume design is the fabrics, and the color and texture of the fabrics is a great way to tell story through costume. 
Jenny Tamim often combines two or more fabrics to make up one costume. Like Game of Thrones, who purchased a lot of fabric from Top Fabric of Soho in London, many of the fabrics for House of the Dragon were purchased there. Most importantly, Top Fabric provided the emerald green fabric for Alicent's statement gown in the We Light the Way episode, and the swirl brocade fabric for her other green gown in episode 9. Damon's silver brocade and Lena's black brocade are also from Top Fabric. The London Fabric Store also custom milled the Targaryen brocade in a variety of colorways. That fabric was used in Rhaenyra's filthy cloak, the lining of Aceris' cloak, and for Alison's wedding gown from a cut scene. I also identified fabrics purchased from Joel and Sons in London and B&J Fabrics in New York. One of my favorite costumes of the season is Rainey's gown made from this gorgeous fabric from Joel and Sons, although they don't have this icy blue color in stock at the moment. Corley's has a costume made from fabric from Joel and Sons and one from B&J Fabrics, as well as Alison Targaryen's gown with a chevron almost dragon textured scale. D'Alessio Galliano Leather Producers in Italy provided many of the leathers for the show. They also produced the leather for Tywin and Cersei's leather costumes in Game of Thrones. In future seasons, I hope we will see more custom woven and printed fabric like we saw in Game of Thrones. Details. The details are an absolute hit. To start, along with the fabrics, there are examples of gorgeous trims, braids and beading, but the standout feature is the embroidery. Michelle Carragher was the principal embroidery artist on Game of Thrones, and she is back with a team of two additional embroidery artists and beaters. They did an incredible job displaying the heraldry and dragon motifs of House Targaryen on Viserys' coat, Rhaenyra's fealty gown, Rhaenyra and Laner's wedding cloak, and Rhaenyra's black cloak fabric gown. There is also a lot of beautiful cutwork detail on both Viserys and Rhaenyra's hunting costumes, including the embossed patchwork Targaryen applique on Viserys' tunic. I like many of the trims, like the spiky detail on the cuffs of young Rhaenyra's fealty gown and finishing details on the costumes, including the Celtic-themed dragon fasteners and dragon talon findings that appear on multiple Targaryen costumes. It was also a pleasant surprise to see some lace in the show. There was no lace in Game of Thrones at all, but in the books, George often writes of Moorish lace, an import from Muir, one of the free cities of western Essos. It's described as delicate, intricate, and filmy. I suspect that the real-world equivalent to Moorish lace would be needle lace and bobbin lace, which were first developed in the 16th century. Along with the embroideries, there are pleating textures on some of the costumes, including Rhaenyra's season finale gown that features a flat chevron pleat that has the appearance of dragon scales. This is a callback to Danny's costume that featured that same pleating technique of her red dragon cape. I also like the subtle use of symbolism that we see on Laris with the firefly in his cane and the brooches worn by his assassins, as well as the fly motif on his buttons. Young Allison's dress appears to foreshadow alliances with Sir Kristen Coles with the chevron pattern on his armor and the detail of Allison's collar of her teal blue gown, which looks similar to the battlement or crenellation of the tower from her house sigil, just to name a few that I've noticed. Jewelry. One of the items on my wish list when I learned that we were going to get a prequel series to Game of Thrones was jewelry. Don't get me wrong, I love the jewelry on Game of Thrones. I just wanted to see more of it. And it was delivered in spades in House of the Dragon. Rings, necklaces, bracelets, earrings, chains of office, brooches, crowns, you name it. Both the men and women in House of the Dragon are festooned with jewelry. Some of the items, like the earrings, necklaces, and rings worn by Alicent and Rhaenyra, are off the rack from a large jewelry retailer, while other items are bespoke. I think that Alicent's seven-pointed star was created for the show, worn with a gold livery chain and chatelaine, a set of short chains for carrying keys, thimble, and or a sewing kit. 
The Hand of the King brooch, for instance, was originally designed for Game of Thrones. At first, I thought it was the same, but now having looked at it, I see they've changed it slightly. The original pin looks similar to the silver-ringed headed grapevine from Gotland, Sweden. They've revised the new Hand of the King brooch to incorporate a Viking-era penannular brooch, similar to this example of a grapevine in Gotland. And if you look at the maester's chains, they look like they've been cobbled together from a Viking Age hoard find. Costume designer Jenny Tamim said that Otto's chains were handcrafted for the show. As well, I believe that Rhaenyra's Valyrian steel necklace was also bespoke. One of the standouts was the jewelry worn by young Rhaenyra with her fealty gown, with the costume designer taking inspiration for the costume from the Byzantine era and some of the jewelry namely her earrings from Moroccan brides. One of the things I loved was seeing all of the chain of office necklaces on many of the men, oftentimes set with gemstones in their house colors. Viserys wears the chain of office of his grandfather, King Jaharis I Targaryen. This item looks custom made, set with rubies. Laner's chain appears to be set with sapphires, while Aegon's is set with emeralds. In future seasons, I hope to see more bespoke jewelry or even acquire from small vendors like Michelle Clapton did on Game of Thrones. Armor. While I like the design of Daemon Targaryen's armors, I have some issues with the execution, so I will touch on that in my Mrs. video. But there are armors in season one that I liked very much. Some standouts for me are the gold cloaks and the Targaryen armor. The gold cloaks are practical with a coat of plates armor and helmet that look like nasal helms. My only quibble is that I think that the armor has a big gap under the arms with just a cloth gambeson worn under their armor, so there's no protection against pointy things. But I like the chevron texture of their cloaks. That pattern appears frequently in season one. The Targaryen soldiers, on the other hand, wear mail under their hardened leather armor. The red breastplate and backplate and skirts with brass studs of the Targ armor were made by Paris Costumes International in Spain. The other armor that I enjoyed were the seven knights vying for a position with the King's Guard. It's very rare to see all of the knights and squires wearing surcoats. It was really funny to see Sir Kristen Cole singled out. Coming from a lesser house, he had no squire, no banner, and no surcoat. Matt Easton mentioned in one of his videos that Kristen's armor is ill-fitting, but I think that that awkwardness worked well here. The other thing I loved was Otto's armor. It was different and refreshing to see that he was wearing mail under his plate armor. But hands down the best armor in the entire season, in my humble opinion, was that of the Valerian armor worn by Corlys, his brother Vaymond, and his son Laner. But I love Corley's armor the best with all of the detailing and gold and fish scale mail under his plate armor. Corley's helm looked like the shape of a scallop, which ties into his pommel and belt buckle. And I haven't dug into the armors in the show so much, but this appears to be inspired by the 15th or 16th century plate armors of the time. Let me know in the comments section what you like most about the House of the Dragon costumes and stay tuned to my House of the Dragon costume misses. Thank you for spending time with me. I'll see you in the next video.